We're going to be starting a series here. A few messages. It should be six. So tell us six things. These six things. If you look in Proverbs chapter 6, just going to read a few verses here. Verse 16. These six things doth the Lord hate. Yea, seven are an abomination unto him. A proud look, a lying tongue, and hands that shed innocent blood, an heart that deviseth wicked imaginations, sorry, a heart that deviseth wicked imaginations, feet that be swift in running to mischief, a false witness that speaketh lies, and he that soweth discord among brethren. Now in viewing these six things, I think the first thing that comes to my mind, at least it should, is I should always take these things that God hates and bring them into the practical realm of my own life. The Bible says that it, the time is such that judgment must begin at the house of God. And if it, for, if it first begin with us, you know, I, it continues and I'm paraphrasing, then what is the end for those that fear not his name? Judgment must begin at the house of God. Would to God the judgment was in her and was self-reflective as opposed to actually God coming and judging his own house in his anger. Obviously our souls are saved forever as part of the body of Christ. But we can still be under the judgment of God, the chastisement of God, if we are to do those things which the Lord hates. So the first we're going to look into is the proud look. 56 times in the Bible, the word proud is mentioned. Proud, being proud or being prideful is the feeling of deep pleasure or satisfaction as a result of one's own achievements, qualities, or possessions. Having an exceptionally or an excessively high opinion of one's own self or of one's own importance is pride. When you're puffed up about yourself, when you think about yourself more highly than you ought and your own achievements and your own qualities and your own possessions and all that has to do with you when you put it up on a higher plane than it ought to be, that is pride. Turn with me to Ezekiel, if you would, Ezekiel chapter 28. We're going to find the first case of pride within the Bible. And go figure where it came from is evident. In Ezekiel chapter 28, I'll let you get there and start to read a different portion of it. It starts talking to the prince of Tyre. In verse 1 it says, The word of the Lord came again unto me, saying, Son of man, say unto the prince of Tyrus, Thus saith the Lord God, Because thine heart is lifted up, and thou hast said, I am a God, and I sit in the seat of God in the midst of the seas. This, this prince has a very puffed up and lift up idea of him, his own self, even going as far as to say, I am God, there in Ezekiel chapter 28. But later on in that passage, we get to get an introduction as to where that mentality has come from. It's the influence of not the prince of Tyre, but the king that led him into this mentality and into this attitude of self. Look down in verse 11 of Ezekiel chapter 28. Moreover, the word of the Lord came unto me, saying, Son of man... Take up a lamentation upon the king of Tyrus, and say unto him, Thus saith the Lord God, Thou sealest up the sum, full of wisdom, and perfect in beauty. Thou hast been in Eden, the garden of God. Every precious stone was thy covering, the sardis, the topaz, and the diamond, the beryl, the onyx, and the jasper, the sapphire, the emerald, and the carbuncle, the, and gold. The workmanship of thy tabrets, of thy pipes, was prepared in thee in the day that thou wast created. Thou art the anointed cherub that covereth, and I have set thee so. Thou wast upon the mountain of God. Thou hast walked up and down in the midst of the stones of fire. Thou wast perfect in thy ways from the day that thou wast created, till iniquity was found in thee. By the multitude of thy merchandise, they have filled the midst of thee with violence, and thou hast sinned. Therefore, I will cast thee as profane out of the mountain of God. I will destroy thee, O covering cherub, from the midst of the stones of fire. The Bible says that these two, the king and the prince, 
that he influenced, both had this puffed up mentality to say likewise and almost to the point with the second that I am God, I am as God, I sit as God. And, and, and the Lord even says, I have set it so. Of the prince he says, yet thou art a man and not God. Thou, though thou set thine heart as the heart of God. The Lord quickly rebukes this mentality within the prince. And he continues on in the context of the king of Tyre when he says in verse 17, Thy heart was lifted up because of thy beauty. Thou hast corrupted thy wisdom by reason of thy brightness. I will cast thee to the ground. I will lay thee before kings that they may behold thee. Thou hast defiled thy sanctuaries by the multitude of thine iniquities, by, by the iniquity of thy traffic. Therefore will I bring forth a fire from the midst of thee. It shall devour thee, and I will bring thee to ashes upon the earth in the sight of all them that behold thee. All they that know thee among the people shall be astonished at thee. Thou shalt be a terror, and never shalt thou be anymore. The judgment is clear for this puffed up mentality. And if you haven't figured it out yet, this king of Tyre is Satan himself. This is describing his fall. This is describing how he was before his fall, where he was the anointed cherub that covered, where he was garnished with great precious stones, anointed to be so, the Bible says in verse 14. It says, I have set thee so. We see here that that old parable, that old proverb come to fruition, come to the truth, come to the forefront where it says pride goeth before destruction and an haughty spirit before a fall. Here's Satan, nothing that he held, nothing that he was, nothing that he possessed was of his own creation. The Bible says that, sa that Satan was created so. God records, I have set thee so. Thy pomp, thy circumstance, thou anointed position within my realm. I set you there. And yet Satan owned it in satisfaction. He puffed himself up as if all that beauty was his own. And because of his beauty, the Bible says he was corrupted. And his wisdom was corrupted. And his brightness made him into a corrupted soul. And his fall was one of, of firm and swift judgment. God brought him down and before all those that he had deceived by his beauty and had he had deceived by his influence were to behold him, astonished as they looked upon the proud that was brought to naught, the proud that now has faced destruction, the haughty that has fallen. God says, I have set thee so, and I will destroy thee. This is a warning for all of us who have set ourselves up or who have been lifted up to a position where we are a leader. Perhaps you're a parent, where you're perhaps a boss, where you're perhaps a leader in, within a congregation. When God lifts you up to this level of esteem, don't think for a moment that this is so that you can puff yourself up within that position. Satan did it. And we see again it recorded in Isaiah chapter 14. Turn with me to Isaiah chapter 14. Another look at this same event. In Isaiah chapter 14, you see Satan in his puffed up mentality, in his mind that was corrupt by reason of his loftiness before all. He's puffed himself up. He saw himself as God. We see that he began to influence others to rise into that same mentality, into that same pit that he eventually fell in. In Isaiah chapter 14, we see the conversation that had happened. How art thou fallen from heaven? Verse 12 says, O Lucifer, son of the morning, how art thou cut down to the ground which didst weaken the nations? He had fallen here. For thou hast said in thine heart, I will ascend into heaven. I will exalt my throne above the stars of God. I will sit also upon the mount of the congregation in the sides of the north. I will ascend above the heights of the cloud. I will be like the Most High. He boasts. He cries. He decries. He says of himself, I will, I will, I will in his own pride and arrogancy. And the Bible records in verse 15, Yet thou shalt be brought down to hell to the sides of the pit. The bitter end of that haughty spirit that falls. God hates the proud. And in the context of what we read of these six things doth the Lord hate, it says the proud look 
as the first. So even the appearance of pride, even the impression of pride, God hates. How much the more? Now we can look at this and we can say, okay, well, clearly Satan is a bad dude. Clearly Satan is, is, is a wicked guy. He's the adversary. And we can just push it off as if it's nothing and be applicable to us. Or we can recognize that God put these stories, these examples, in the Scripture so that we might behold them and learn from them. Use Satan then as an example to judge and to evaluate your own self. Go to Psalms with me, which if you would. Psalms chapter 12. There's so many verses, 56 I said, that describe pride and its effect and its influence and how it makes men. In, in Psalms, as we walk through just a few portions here, we'll see how the pride of people affects them and how the proud themselves behave. Verse or chapter 12 and verse 3 says, The Lord shall cut off all flattering lips, and the tongue that speaketh proud things. We said the Lord hates the proud look, and how much more? The proud. And now he even reveals to us through the scriptures that he will cut off the flattering lips, and the tongue which speaketh proud things. That high view of self-importance, that high view of self often leads to a heart that is bent towards that condition. And when you have a heart that thinks highly of yourselves, the Bible says, of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaketh. You can't help but hold in what is in your heart. It is going to come out eventually. I've heard that saying, what do you get when you squeeze a lemon? You get whatever is on the inside. And quite often when people are put in a squeeze, in a stressful situation, they're put under a little bit of pressure, what's on the inside tends to bubble out. They can't contain themselves. Even so it is with the heart, proud things within the heart have no choice but to come out. They are manifest in the words of the proud. The next thing that we notice, look at verse 17. Chapter 17, my apologies. Chapter 17 and verse 8. It says, Keep me as the apple of thine eye. Hide me under the shadow of thy wings. From the wicked that oppresseth me. From my deadly enemies who compass me about. They are enclosed in their own fat. With their mouth they speak proudly. They have now compassed us in our steps. They have set their eyes bowing down. To the earth. We see here that, that the wicked, the proud doer, first of all, it's one that if they're coming at you, you are free and at liberty to pray against, even as David did unto God. But recognize here also that when pride is within you, then you become that one that is dealing as the wicked. You are a deadly enemy to those that are humble. You are enclosing the humility of the, the humble folks, within themselves. You have closed them in. And now you're compassing them about. We see that play out. Verse 13 says, Arise, O Lord, and disappoint him. Cast him down. Deliver my soul from the wicked, which is thy sword. From men which are thy hand. O Lord, from men of the world, which have their portion in this life, whose belly thou fillest with hid treasure, and they are full of children, they leave the rest of their substance to their babes. These prideful are of the world. And it's clear. It describes here David praying out to God that he would give reprieve from these wicked that are, dis that are coming after him, after his soul, in their own pride and in their own arrogancy. Psalm 31, you see. Psalm 31 and verse 18. Let the lying lips be put to silence, which speak grievous things proudly and contemptuously against God. The righteous. Oh, how great is thy goodness, which thou hast laid up for them that fear thee, which thou hast wrought for them that trust thee for the sons of men. And as you read this, you can think, okay, well, I'm on the defensive of those that are proud. And I can pray unto God and seek that he would help me to have these lying lips put to silence, to have this grievous, proud, contemptuous attack coming at me, that I would behold and receive of the great goodness of God because I fear him. 
But just the same, you can look in this passage, and when your own heart begins to bubble up with that pride, when you start to think of yourself more highly than, you're, than you ought, and we are all susceptible for it because pride is of this world, and it's just another lust of the flesh that can engulf a Christian, whether we're rich or poor or whatever way of life we live, pride will be the beginning of all of our destructions. And you can recognize that when you're in a state of proud, of pride and proudness, you are the one that is being contentious with those that are righteous. Your natural inclination is to be that lying lips, is to be that grievous tongue, is to be that one that attacks and hurts and harms the people of the Lord. We're to have no respect for the proud. Psalm verse 40, Psalm verse 40 says, we're to have no respect for for the proud. Look at verse 4. Blessed is the man that maketh the Lord his trust, and respecteth not the proud, nor such as turn aside unto lies. And how often do we have this great respect for those that are in leadership, who are puffed up in their own pride and arrogancy, and we have respect for them. We lift them up. The Bible teaches that we're not to have respect for the proud. In fact, we are to, we are to receive blessing because our trust is in the Lord and not in the arm of men. Because that's what you see when you quite often look at a strong leader, at a strong person in this world, is that they are doing great things whereby you could trust in them to lead in a direction. But our charge is to trust in the Lord. And if you are that person, again, who's been put in a position, don't let yourself get puffed up because the people of God who are humble will actually be blessed in having zero respect for you. Isn't that, a, isn't that a, a fearful thing? That the people around you, when you're proud and when you're arrogant, will actually be blessed because they don't respect you. Because they put you down in a position where they, they cannot esteem you even the way you ought to be. Because you're so welled up with pride. God has no choice but to look to the humble and bless them and take the proud and arrogant and not have respect for them. And he encourages thus within his own people, to not hold those in esteem within the confines of the scriptures and the, the rules of authority that we've already talked about from time to time. Psalm chapter 94, and this is a longer portion of scripture, Psalm, Psalm chapter 94. <clears throat> Psalm 94 reveals God's respect for the proud. Psalm 94 and verse 1, O Lord God, to whom vengeance belongeth, O God, to whom vengeance belongeth, show thyself. Lift up thyself, thou judge of the earth, and render a reward to the proud. Hear the people of God crying out that they would have reproof from, again, the proud. Lord, how long shall the wicked, how long shall the wicked triumph? How long shall they utter and speak hard things, and all the workers of iniquity boast themselves? They break in pieces thy people, O Lord, and afflict thine heritage. They slay the widow and the stranger, and murder the fatherless. Yet they say, The Lord shall not see, neither shall the God of Jacob regard it. Understand, ye brutish among people, ye fools, when will ye be wise? He that planted the ear, shall he not hear? He that formed the eye, shall he not see? He that chastises the heathen, shall he not correct? He that teacheth man knowledge, shall he not know? The Lord knoweth the thoughts of men, that they are vanity. And so when David cries out here unto God to have help from the proud, it is evident that the proud have no position, no right, no justification for thinking the way they ought. Can they... Did they plant the ear? Did they form the eye? Can they correct the heathen? Can they teach us knowledge? No, but God can do all these things. And God is the only one then that ought to be lift up in that position. Lift up to be able to say things like, I will, I will, I will, I will, as Satan did. God is the only high and lofty one that is deserving of praise, and the, he's the only one that is able to boast in himself. And yet too often Christians take on that mentality of Satan himself, and they start to think, I will pay my bills. I will get this job. I will take care of my family. I will. And there's so many different ways in our life that seem innocent, 
But when we take it upon ourselves to make these I will statements and boasting in our own glory, lifting ourselves up as if we can do anything at all, we're in a position of pride. Remember what he said to Satan before he fell. He said, I have set thee so. Your riches, your beauty, your substance, your everything. I have set thee so. And then he continues and said, I will destroy thee. Because he took of all of those things that God had given him, all those gifts of God, and he made them his own doing, and he lifted himself up as if he was the reason why he was beautiful. He was the reason why he was appointed to the position of the anointed cherub that covereth. And how often do we face the same things? When I, I, I worked my way up to that position of my job. I have raised my children. I have done this great work. I have won these many to the, to the Lord. I, 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 I. We just are constantly decrying of our own goodness. And it's a foolish thing before a God that formed your eye, formed your ear, formed your mouth, formed your tongue, gave you everything that you have, and then you look at him as if you've done it of your own. It's foolish and it's wicked, that, that seed of pride that can enter into the heart of a man. And it will not be long before that bubbles out of your mouth. And it will not be long before the people around you start to recognize it. What do they do? What are they asked to do by the scriptures? They're going to have no respect for God. They're not to esteem them in that manner. In contrast, Christians are to be a people, as God's people, who are not even looking proud. Right? The proud look is that which God hateth. So if he hates the appearance of pride, if he hates that outward show of pride, how much more does he hate the proud heart? Christians aren't even to look that way, but rather, as it says in 1 Peter chapter 5, it says, be clothed with humility. When people look on the outward of a Christian, they should see the spiritual clothing that reveals them as a humble person. That doesn't mean you have to walk around in rags like John the Baptist. What it's saying is, spiritually speaking, the outward show of the Christian's behavior ought to be one of humility and not of pride. Do not look proud and prideful. Psalm chapter 119. We'll just go to a few more verses here. Psalm 119. And verse 21 is going to begin to contrast these two ideas. Psalm 119. And verse 21 says this. Thou hast rebuked the proud that are cursed, which do err from thy commandments. Remove me from, remove from me reproach and contempt, for I have kept thy testimonies. The great line between the proud and the humble is divided in how God would react to them. He rebukes and he curses the proud. And yet he is willing to receive the prayers and grounds and gives them ground to ask them, whereby the humble in spirit can have reproach and contempt removed from their life. Do you want to be rebuked and cursed of God? Or do you want to be able to come humbly before his throne and have him remove stresses and hardships from you? And you actually have the grounds to go to him with those things. Don't think that you can come to God with a puffed up heart. You've already, you've already made it, right? You've got the good job. You've got the, you've got the beautiful house and the, and the beautiful wife. You've got, you've got the, the great car. You've got everything. You've done it all on yourself. And then you're like, God, these people are picking on me at work. Well, you're puffed up in all of these attitudes and all these areas. Why would you think that God was going to step in and allow you even grounds to ask for help in something like being like humble and saying, God, would you help me in this area? No, I don't think he will. Psalm 119 and verse 78. Let the proud be ashamed, for they dealt perversely with me without a cause. But I will meditate in thy precepts. The proud are going to be ashamed in the end. The Bible teaches that we'll never be ashamed as believers. If we remain humble in this life, the same is true. We'll never be ashamed in this world because we're walking in the precepts and we're grounded in those. So we see that there's a clear divide, and it always has to do with what? It has to do with the proud behaving out of their carnal mind and heart, and the humble being within the precepts. Continues on, and there's some other examples. Verse 51, the proud are in derision. Uh, they're, they're forming lies in verse 69. In verse 85, they're digging pits for those that are humble. And 
Don't think for a second that when you're puffed up with pride, you're on an island to yourself and you're not affecting those around you. Even though you're not purposely doing it, you are having the humble and derision when you're full of pride. You are forging lies against them, building up falsities about yourself and, and claiming some sort of story um, just by your actions. You're digging pits for those that are humble because you're so welled up with pride. But the contrast and the best way to avoid being proud and the opposite effect that happens is it comes from being grounded in the Word. The humble, the Bible says, in all these points are not declining from the law. They are keeping the precepts. With the whole heart they are meditating upon thy law. And that is the best way to get pride out of your life. Even when I was born again, the first thing that I discovered was there were many things that I was sinning in without understanding that I was sinning. So I was puffed up thinking that I was a pretty good person, even now as a safe person. You know, I do a little bit of this, I do a little bit of that, but I haven't murdered. I know that's one of the commandments. I'm starting to sort of gauge myself in the Christian life and how I would fall into it. I'm, I'm already a pretty good Christian. But as I got into the Word, I figured out pretty fast that I'm not a very good Christian. There are many things within the Bible that record and expose my heart of wickedness, even as a saved, blood-bought individual. And it, it took being humble and hearing, receiving, and then acting out practically what I had heard and received. Acting out practically what I had heard and received. And that's the flow of the Word of God to cleanse a believer. And so if you don't want to be one that is rebuked of God, cursed of God, ashamed of God, adding derision to other people's lives around you, forging lies against those that are around you, digging pits whereby your loved ones will fall, and if you don't want to be that, you need to be inclined unto the law of the Lord at all times. You need to keep the precepts with thy whole heart. You need to meditate in the scriptures and when you do, you are humble and you can come before God. And as it says in verse 122, you can cry out and say, Let not the proud oppress me. I'm a humble person. And yet the proud are coming at me. And yet, yet this pride is still trying to grab a hold of me. That's the end of the person that is humble. That they can come to God. They can be cleansed of the washing water of the word of God. And they can continue to walk in that thing. And that's our only antidote to having a proud heart is to administer the word of God and his grace allow it to come over us. Proverbs, again in chapter 16. Proverbs chapter 16. Just a few more places. Proverbs 16. Proverbs 16 and verse 5 says, Everyone that is proud in heart is an abomination to the Lord. Though hand join in hand, he shall not be unpunished. So everyone that is proud, even you believers, everyone that is puffed up, even you believers, is abomination unto the Lord. If you are going to live your life in pride and arrogancy, though hand join in hand, in other words, though there's a million just like you, just yoked up with you, proud, arrogant, me, 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 I, I, I mentality that's going on in this whole world, right? It's, it's iPhone. It's YouTube. It's all about me, 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 right? If you're going to be yoked up in that world, though hand join in hand, you're an abomination of the Lord. You will not be punished. Watch yourself, Christian. Don't admit, don't, don't behave in this area. Don't act like a lost person. You're saved. You're blood bought. You're redeemed. Verse 21, or chapter 21, and verse 4, one more place. And high look and a proud heart and the plowing of the wicked is sin. If you're going to walk around with that high look, that proud heart, if you're going to plow and work and your mentality is always going to be that, that is sin unto you, and you are caught in that trap, and you are in that depth, and you are in that trouble, and God will not look past it. He'll catch you in that. Those sins will catch up to you, and you will not succeed. You will not excel. You will not have your prayers answered. You'll continue to be somebody that is, that, that is hostile and that is, that is poisonous to those that are around you, and you're going to wonder why. And it's because you have this high image of self and pride will not be blessed of the Lord. It's abomination unto him, even the look of it. 